Ah, hola, mi nombre es Carla Quesada. Buenas tardes. Gracias por estar acá. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Carla Quesada. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, having us here and thank you for being here with us today. Gracias, señor presidente, a nombre de todos los trabajadores de bajo contrato federal en este país. Me, me gustaría darle las gracias al presidente Obama por escuchar nuestras demandas al firmar la orden ejecutiva, alzando nuestros salarios 10 dólares con 10 centavos por hora. Esta orden no solo ayuda a cientos de, de miles de trabajadores bajo, bajo en contratos federales, sino que trabajadores en compañía como CAP e IKEA están siguiendo el ejemplo que el presidente ha puesto en cuanto a los salarios de sus trabajadores. Uh, on behalf of uh, all the low-wage uh, federal contract workers in America, I would like to say thank you to President Obama for listening to us and signing the executive order raising our pay to $10.10 an hour. Not only will hundreds of thousands of federal contract workers be helped, but so will workers at private companies like The Gap and IKEA that are following the pres president's call to action. El trato que recibimos los trabajadores bajo contratos federales refleja como en este país compañías re rentable pueden pagar lo, min lo, lo mínimo a sus empleados y en algunos casos menos de lo mínimo, mientras los trabajadores sufren para sobrevivir y mantener a su familia. Uh, the treatment of low-wage federal contract workers uh, reflects uh, how our nation allows profitable companies to get away with paying the bare minimum, and in some cases less, while workers struggle to survive and support our families. He trabajado en la plaza de comida en el edificio federal Ronald Reagan Building en Washington, D.C. por más de 11 años, pero en ese tiempo mi salario subió muy poco. Es difícil poder mantener a mis hijos cuando los precios siguen subiendo. Pero mi salario es el mismo de siempre. Aunque trabajo en algunos... Sorry. Está bien, tú puedes. Aunque trabajo en algunas ocasiones más de 40 horas a la semana, nunca he recibido pago por trabajar horas extra. Es más, no recibo seguro médico ni algún otro beneficio por mis servicios. En una ocasión me corté el dedo por accidente y me, me vi forzada a pagar $1,200 dólares, casi mi salario de un mes. Cuando mi empleador se rehusó a pagar mi tratamiento. I have been a food court worker in the Ronald Reagan Federal Building in Washington, D.C., just uh, a couple blocks away, uh, for over 11 years, and my pay has barely gone up. It's hard to provide for my kids when prices continue to rise and my pay stays the same. Even though I often worked more than 40 hours a week, I also never received a dime in overtime pay. On top of all this, I don't even get health care benefits or pay time off. And to add insult to injury, I was forced to pay $1,200 in medical bills, about a month's wages, after I cut my finger preparing food for customers and my employer refused to pay for treatment. Por esta razón, mis compañeros y yo nos unimos en la compañía Good Job Donation para seguir que para asegurar que el gobierno federal haga negocios con, con que no que no haga negocios con compañías que mantienen sus trabajadores en la miseria. Salimos en huelga nueve veces durante este último año, alzando nuestra voz para exigir mejores condiciones laborales. 
y la habilidad de negociar con nuestros empleadores. These are the reasons why my coworkers and I joined together to fight for a good jobs nation and make sure that the federal government doesn't do business with companies that keep workers in poverty. We went on strike nine times over the past year, raising our voices to demand better working conditions and a seat at the table. Un salario mínimo de 10 dólares con 10 centavos es un muy buen paso en el camino hacia mejores, mejorar nuestras condiciones durante su discurso sobre el estado de la unión. El presidente anunció la orden ejecutiva de 10 dólares con 10 centavos. También usó el ejemplo de la compañía Costco como un ejemplo que todo deberí, deberíamos seguir, dijo Costco paga salarios más altos porque sabe que es lo mejor manten, mantener de mejor, mejorar la productividad y reducir el reemplazo de los empleados. Nosotros deberíamos de hacer también estos, esto es, también estoy en... Estoy de acuerdo con el presidente y espero que más contratistas federales paguen salarios dignos con, con beneficios, terminen con el robo de salario y dejen que los trabajadores formen una unión sin in, interferir. Si Costco puede hacerlo, también lo puede hacer las compañías que hacen negocio con el gobierno federal. The 1010 minimum wage is a good first step forward. At the State of the Union, when the president announced the 1010 executive order, he held up Costco as a model American employer. He said, Costco sees paying higher wages as a smart way to boost productivity and reduce turnover. We should too. Well, I agree with the president and hope more federal contractors will be like Costco and pay living wages and benefits and wage theft and allow workers to form unions without interference. If Costco can do it, so can every company that contracts with the U.S. government. Como inmigrante a este país, quiero darles el sueño americano a mis hijos, mis compañeros y yo seguiremos luchando para mejor, mejorar nuestras condiciones la, laborales. Si sí se puede. <laughs> As an immigrant to this country, I want to live the American dream. My colleagues and I will continue to fight to improve our working conditions so we can provide a better life for our children. Yes, we can. Thank you. Hey, everyone. I just want to take this moment to introduce uh, Delegate Tom Hucker, who's here today. Um, with his hard work, we helped increase Maryland's minimum wage to 1010, and he's every day advocating for low wage, waker, uh, low wage uh, workers. And um, we're, just give a round of applause to Delegate Tom Hooker. Thank you. Thank you. And th thank you, Carla, and thanks for all your good work and the good work of all the champions of change. Um, it's really an honor to be here to help recognize it today. Um, I want to thank uh, Lou especially. I'm a native of St. Louis and a fan, I've been a fan of vintage vinyl since I was 12 years old. Um, I'd like to say it was um, because I was seeking out, you know, responsible businesses to patronize, but I think it was really your killer collection of Led Zeppelin LPs at that time. Um, dude. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to share our experience raising the minimum wage in Maryland, but first uh, let me give you a little background. Um, we're all here because, of course, um, as with other common sense policies, Congress has failed to raise the minimum wage. For decades, the minimum wage uh, has been raised by Congress under both Democratic and Republican administrations. It's always had bi bipartisan support and was seen as something that just needed to be done, just like passing a highway funding bill. Um, but this Thursday marks a very sad anniversary. It marks five years since the last time Congress raised the minimum wage. After five years of congressional inaction, the need to raise the minimum wage is uh, uh, greater than ever. Overall, wages have been stagnant. Workers have had to suffer downward pressure on wages due to the Great Recession and the slow recovery. It's a very good thing James Madison and the other framers gave powers to the states to act when Congress didn't. 
uh, they couldn't have envisioned the current 113th Congress, which will be the least productive in the history of the Republic, breaking the recent record of the 112th Congress uh, as the least productive. If, um, if uh, Madison and the other framers had envisioned this, I think they would have given the states more powers. So as of January 2013, 19 states had raised minimum wages higher than the federal level, um, but most were, were uh, less than a dollar over the current $7.25. President Obama called for dramatic action on the minimum wage in 2013 uh, in the State of the Union Address. And he specifically urged states to uh, act because Congress has not. Since then, 13 more states have stepped up and done so. In Annapolis, uh, there had been numerous unsuccessful earlier attempts to raise the minimum wage in Maryland. And as recently as 2013, the Maryland Senate killed by a wide 8 to 3 margin a minimum wage bill that was very similar to the bill that we passed last April. So those efforts had, had always been one or two earnest legislators working with a relatively weak campaign behind them. So what was different uh, with our minimum wage campaign, our successful minimum wage campaign in Maryland in 2014? Well, I think there's at least seven major factors I want to uh, present to you this morning. Um, one is, this afternoon, uh, there was national pressure and visibility on this issue, starting with the President's call in the State of the Union address for a 10-10 federal minimum wage. Uh, that laid down a marker for what is right, what states are expected to do, where the Democratic Party should be as well. What we, we all knew, and he didn't have to say, was that if we, we failed to pass a higher minimum wage, we were not substantively different than a very, very unpopular Congress. Second, we knew other states were taking action as well. The, um, in Annapolis, we knew Connecticut and other states were likely to pass legislation this year, and we wouldn't be the only ones. Third, in addition to the national media pressure, there was a coordinated national advocacy campaign this year, specifically behind the catchy benchmark of $10.10. And there had been a terrific effort to organize fast food workers that's gathered uh, national uh, media attention and profiled minimum wage workers who middle class consumers come into contact with quite frequently. Fourth, uh, this year is an election year, and we can wish state assemblies always pass sound and, and popular legislation every year, and uh, sometimes they do, even over the objections of special interests, but we all know it's much more likely to happen in an election year. Fifth, some of those national advocates were very active in Maryland. Uh, and they were not the usual suspects that we had seen every year behind earlier efforts. This year we saw unusual suspects like the very impressive businesses for a fair minimum wage, uh, many of whose leaders are here uh, today. So congratulations to Holly. <laughs> to, to Holly and Lonnie and Lou and Paul and Carmen Larson and probably others I'm not even sure are here. Um, so much of passing legislation is creating a climate where persuadable committee members have the arguments they need and feel comfortable pushing back against the arguments of opponents. Um, when in my committee, uh, we had seen year after year businesses only oppose the minimum wage increase and not for the minimum wage increase. My colleagues don't have the arguments they need. Um, but when they see 180 Maryland businesses sign on in support of the minimum wage increase, and when they hear their arguments um, about why raising the minimum wage will help and not hurt the local economy and the retail economy, it's much easier for my colleagues to support because they can point to that testimony and use those arguments when they go back to their districts and explain their votes, even before local chambers of commerce. So thank you for all, all your work on that. Um, sixth, this year, spurred by the President's call to action, our local jurisdictions got into the game. In the past, Baltimore City and some of our big counties had submitted written testimony in support of a state minimum wage bill, but what was different this year was that the local governments didn't wait for the state to take action. Instead, our two largest jurisdictions, Montgomery County and Prince George's County, each of, whom each of which represents nearly a million people, over a million in Montgomery County, they began to consider raising their own minimum wage and not waiting for the state. And so that Montgomery County wouldn't be at any competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis neighboring jurisdictions, the bill's sponsor, Council Member Mark Elrich, organized an informal compact with Prince George's County Council Chair Andrea Harrison and Phil Mendelson, the president of the DC, the chair of the DC City Council um, for the District of Columbia. All three local lawmakers agreed to pass an $11.50 minimum wage if the other jurisdictions did as well. And each locality held up its end of the bargain. 
so that by the time the Maryland General Assembly met in January 2014, not only had neighboring DC set its minimum wage at 1150, but the two largest counties in Maryland had done so as well. Um, that gave a big boost and visibility to the statewide minimum wage effort before the legislative session had even opened, and it removed any reason for any minimum wage opponents from the two biggest counties in the state to show up in Annapolis in opposition to the bill. It also, for those of us in the DC area, it meant the passage of this regional compact largely removed any argument that our businesses would be at any competitive disadvantage locally. So that was highly significant as well. But finally, what was likely the biggest game changer was Governor O'Malley's leadership on this, this issue. The governor had always supported earlier efforts to raise the minimum wage, but this year he not only made it part of his administration package, it was the number one issue he discussed in the State of the State address to us in January. It led the news coverage that day and throughout the beginning of the legislative session. And the governor got very personally involved by testifying for the bill, speaking at rallies and press conferences, rounding up the votes we needed to pass it through the committees and through the House and Senate floor, and urging the Speaker and the Senate President to prioritize it. We had vigorous struggle, struggles over amendments, of course, starting in my, in my committee in the House, um, amendments over whether we should index the wage, what we do for tipped workers, whether we should allow a training wage, uh, and for how long, which industries would be exempted, arguments that are you, you all are your bread and butter, you've heard in, in every state. Um, and one especially dangerous amendment we defeated would have set two different minimum wage tiers, one for more expensive counties and one for less expensive ones. After we passed the bill through the House and sent it over to the Senate, they insisted on delaying the implementation schedule, which we weren't happy about. Um, but to their credit, they insisted on getting a commitment from the administration to also raise the wages of 38,000 nonprofit contract workers who serve the developmentally disabled. Those uh, contract workers uh, had always been paid above the federal minimum. So when we raised the state minimum, they, we had to make a commitment to put more money in the state budget to raise their wages as well. And uh, to the credit of the Senate and the governor, they, agree, they agreed to that and those workers are getting a raise as well. Finally, um, we had a powerful array of opponents who made the usual arguments and employed some unusual tactics. So let me share one, since you all are practitioners, I think you'd appreciate. Like all lawmakers, we rely very much on our fiscal notes. They're supposed to be clear-eyed, nonpartisan analyses of the economic and fiscal impact of legislation. Here's the fiscal note for the minimum wage bill, and here's the, in exactly the same font and format and diction as the phony fiscal note we were uh, presented with, with a one Orwellian quote that says, personal increase will decrease in Maryland beginning in tw FY 2015 through F FY 2020 due to increases in the minimum wage, as illustrated in the following chart. And then it, uh, it predicts a loss of between 630 million to 1.07 billion in personal income, depending on the wage level we required. So this is just one of the many tactics we had to overcome, and I found it, found it uh, uh, pretty entertaining. Um, but but decide, despite tactics like that, we managed to pass a, a minimum wage law in Maryland that raises the minimum wage in several stages up to the 10, 10 an hour, which will provide a long overdue raise for over 400,000 workers in Maryland. And for those of you who think this is easy, in relatively blue and liberal Maryland, I want to tell you that's not the case. Only eight years ago, we had a conservative governor, and unlike a state the size of California, every time we raise wages or raise taxes, um, my colleagues have real concerns about the cross-border impact um, and the impact on a small state's economy. We're in many ways a border state, not a, a northeastern progressive state, and we're surrounded by lower wage, more conservative jurisdictions. But hopefully by raising the minimum wage in Maryland, we're setting an example for and providing a boost to minimum wage uh, efforts in West Virginia, in Virginia, and Pennsylvania, and Delaware as well. So just a few lessons that I, I draw from this. One is the progress that we've shown in Maryland and the other states uh, over the last, last 18 months shows that any state can and should raise their minimum wage. And the success we've had in, in these states doesn't absolve the other states of their responsibility. The public strongly supports increase in the minimum wage in every state, not just coastal states, not just blue states. Second, state action doesn't absolve Congress of its responsibility either. State laws uh, give a long overdue raise to millions of hardworking families, but it doesn't mean Congress uh, doesn't have their responsibility to take action as well. Just as Montgomery and Prince George's actions made it easier to pass statewide legislation, the action in dozens of states now should make it easier for Congress to finally act on raising the minimum wage as well. And progress like this shows really what can happen when you bring together workers and organizers and business owners with some political leadership. You can get great things done in any state in America or even in Congress, we hope. Which, which brings us to why we're here today. As they say, the, the job of electives is to do what's politically possible and the job of activists is to change what's politically possible. You all have already changed what's possible. One of my favorite bumper stickers is the one that says, if the people lead, the leaders will follow. Well, that's 
e absolutely true in the case of minimum wage laws. And it's why we're here today to celebrate the leadership that you all have shown. So I want to thank President Obama for setting this progress in motion and to thank all the champions of change for creating the fierce urgency to raise the state and local minimum wage laws in the last two years. Too often, governors and lawmakers get all the headlines and all the credits. Um, but the public doesn't see the organizers and the researchers who make these campaigns possible. And they don't see the minimum wage workers and the business owners who volunteer their time to make the powerful arguments uh, to our, my colleagues to do the right thing. That's why events like today's are so important, so that you get the recognition you deserve, and so that your work will convince other people who are watching today that they too can make a difference and they should get involved in their states. So thank you very much and congratulations. I'm uh, privileged to introduce Chris Liu, the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Labor, who will now introduce you to our Champions of Change. Deputy Secretary Liu um, previously served in the White House as an assistant to pres the President and, as a, the cab and to the Cabinet Secretary. He first started working with the President in 2005 when he served as then Senator Obama's Legislative Director and Acting Chief of Staff. Please welcome Deputy Secretary Liu. Uh, thank you, Tom, so much for the introduction, for your hard work uh, on really just a, uh, an important effort. I know you're, it was only possible because of your tireless work, and I want to thank Carla as well for sharing that wonderful story uh, with us and for the important work that you do every day as well. Uh, welcome, all of you, to the White House. It is wonderful to see you. Uh, I love that um, while people are listening, people are also tweeting as well, and so I love that conversation that's happening, and I will, since we're talking about Twitter, I will give a shameless plug uh, for myself, which is Chris Lou 44 uh, Feel free to follow me. Uh, my name is actually misspelled on the, uh, on, on the program, so you wouldn't find me that way, so I just wanted to uh, let you know that. Uh, it is an honor to be here today on behalf of the President and on behalf of Secretary of Labor Tom Perez uh, to honor all of the men and women who are fighting so hard uh, around the country to fight for and uh, to ensure that hard work is rewarded with a fair wage. You know, we are in the 50th anniversary of the celebrations of the Civil Rights Act, and as we've been reflecting on these 50th anniversaries, which were um, largely about racial justice, it's also important to talk about economic justice as well. And we've been looking back at some of the speeches that the Secretary of Labor at the time, back in 1964, um, a wonderful hero named Willard Wirtz gave. And in a speech in 1964, Labor Secretary Wirtz said, the right to work in the sense of there being a job available is an essential right. So is the right to be ready for the jobs that are and will be available. And the challenges that Secretary Wirtz that so many people thought about 50 years ago still remain, but I want all of you to know that we are committed to making progress. Just 30 minutes ago or so, President Obama signed into law the Workforce Investment uh, and Opportunity Act. Now, this is an important bill that will help workers acquire the skills and training they need to punch their ticket to the middle class. But that doesn't begin to tell the whole story. Far, far too many of our people are working harder and falling further behind. Opportunity is becoming more elusive for more Americans. And the basic bargain that we know about, the basic bargain that if you work hard, you can get ahead, that basic bargain is getting harder and harder for people in this country to achieve. Now, to be sure, workers are holding up their end of the bargain. They're doing everything that's being asked of them. Worker product productivity has increased more than 90% since 1979, but wages for production and non-supervisory workers has barely budged. It's like a whole generation is running in place. It's not that there's no wealth or prosperity. It's that workers aren't getting the fair share of that wealth and prosperity. The, the, the pie that they're helping to bake is leading to smaller and smaller slices for American workers. As the President often says, as Secretary Perez often says, 
it is unconscionable that somebody working full time in the wealthiest nation on earth has to live in poverty. And that's one of the reasons why the president, it's one of the reasons why the secretary fought to increase the minimum wage at $10.10 an hour. As all of you know, this would benefit 28 million workers in this country and lift 2 million people out of poverty. And the bill before Congress that Tom talked about would for the first time in 22 years raise the tipped minimum wage from, uh, from $2.13 an hour. We all know that the people who serve us meals in restaurants should make enough to serve their own families a decent meal at home. And the president is fighting for this raise because he believes in opportunity for all, because he believes that everyone should have a chance to make it in this country. But you know that you can't have opportunity if you're at work and you're worried about whether you're going to have enough money to pay the utility bill, or you're worried that just one, you're one car accident away from financial ruin. As all of you know well, the minimum wage just isn't keeping up with the cost of living. It's lost 20% of its value since 1980s. And it's like the cost of, and it's not like, as all of you know, it's not like the cost of uh, the things that you purchase, whether it's milk or a bus fare. Uh, it's not like they've declined by 20% since the 1980s. And it's not like your rent payments have gone down by 20%. Minimum wage workers aren't looking for a handout. They want to be self-sufficient. But so many of them have no other choice than to rely on public assistance. They don't want to resort to food stamps to put dinner on the table. They want the pride that a paycheck can provide to them and their families. And here's the thing. Raising the minimum wage is the right thing to do, and it's the smart thing to do. It's a question of economic justice. It's also a question about business competitiveness and economic growth. Higher wages, as the business folks in this room know, increases worker productivity and morale. It also decreases turnover and training costs. This is really one of those classic win-wins for both business and workers. And you know what you do? What, what happens to money that you put in workers' pockets? They spend it. And they pump it right back into the economy, which helps more businesses grow and creates more jobs. So even though Congress still has not gotten on board, states and localities aren't sitting around waiting. They're taking matters into their own hands and increasing the minimum wages. And the evidence suggests that their economies aren't suffering. Just recently, a group called the Center of Economic Policy and Research did a state-by-state -state look. And they found that the 30 states that have raised their minimum wages since the beginning of, of this year have achieved, on, uh, on average, uh, higher job growth than those states that didn't uh, raise their minimum wage. So the president isn't waiting. I know all of you are not waiting. And that's one of the reasons why he's raised the minimum wage for workers on new federal service contracts. And it's one of the reasons why the president and all of us at the Department of Labor are working to fix the nation's overtime rules, which have also failed to keep up with inflation, which have also failed to keep up with changes in our economy. So closing the wage gap is one of the central public policy challenges of our time. It's one of the keys to addressing income inequality, and it really goes to the heart of the anxieties that working families feel each day in their homes. It is simply put one of the most important steps that we can take to strengthen the middle class and give workers the economic security they deserve. So I'm optimistic that we can rise to the challenge. And one of the reasons I'm optimistic is because I've read the stories of the wonderful champions of change. Now, I know that I, we have a president. I know that we have a secretary who care deeply about this issue. But I'm optimistic because I see the champions of change as people of enormous passion and principle, advocates who are working relentlessly and successfully to improve their communities. Because as hard as the president is working, because as hard as Secretary Perez is working, the real hard work is being done by all of you, the champions of change. All of you are pushing the envelope and winning important victories in cities and states all around the country. You are the innovators. You aren't waiting around for Washington to act. 
And that's one of the reasons why it was important for me to be here and to convey my appreciation on behalf of my boss, the Secretary of Labor. The work that you do inspires us each and every day, and you are doing your most to keep this issue at the forefront of the national debate. And I want to assure all of you that we are going to be your partners in this important effort. Congratulations on this recognition, and good luck in all the work ahead.